Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our mask ultrasound Zoom meeting tonight. And we have a very funny but very uh, distinguished speaker tonight in the person of Dr. Sadiq Bayani, MD, FRCA, FFP, MRCA, FIPP, CIPS. He's an anesthesiologist and a pain medicine trained in the UK. He completed his fellowship at the Royal College of Anesthetists at the United Kingdom. And he went on to complete his pain fellowship at the University of Toronto in Canada. And uh, he's got uh, so many uh, educational materials and lectures, and he's just all over the place. I cannot uh, identify everything here, but he started and co-founded a program of Leicester Pain Education of Gulf Pain School and Mumbai Pain School. So he's originally from uh, India and uh, he has written a lot of articles and book chapters and discuss uh, so many interesting topics on pain medicine, neuromodulation, regenerative therapies, cryotherapy, and innovations in the field of education and chronic pain. Now, we're happy to have uh, Dr. Bayani tonight, and uh, I'm sure he will enjoy his lecture. But before we proceed, let's just pause for a moment for a short prayer. Let us pray. Our great God and Savior, we would like, Lord, to thank you for this opportunity that we can gather and learn from our friend from UK, Dr. Sadiq Bayani. We thank you, Lord, for giving him all the expertise to share us this uh, topic where he will discuss about pain management on different joints. We ask, Lord, that I will keep us safe wherever we may be, use our talents to serve others and to promote good health. We would like, Lord, to ask that I will continue to guide us and your Holy Spirit and your Holy Angels will continue to guide us wherever we are. We ask, Lord, for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, introducing to you Dr. Sadiq Bayani from the Thank UK. Thank you so much, Jim. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I could see tall guys already there. Tall guys are next distinguished speaker on, on 10th of March. Hi, tall guy. Right. So uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Jim, and really appreciate you giving me an opportunity to, to share my knowledge and expertise in this field of uh, major joint pain, the shoulder, knee and hip joint. And uh, I've kept the title What's New because there's, there are lots of developments that have taken place recently in this field. So uh, my dis you know, uh, disclosures is nothing to declare. I'm, I'm a certified interventional pain sonologist. I'm a fellow of interventional pain practice. And I, uh, I'm, I, I work as an examiner for these two exams conducted by World Institute of Pain. As you've already kind of mentioned, uh, you know, I started uh, Leicester Pain Education when I started as a consultant in Leicester back in 2015. Uh, and then, you know, uh, went on and founded Gulf Pain School to, to spread the education in Gulf region in Middle East and North Africa. And then Mumbai Pain School to, to, to take things further to India. I work as a deputy lead for ePain, which is basically an online pain uh, library for trainees in the United Kingdom from Faculty of Pain Medicine, Royal College of Anesthetists. So why did I put this topic? You know, what, what questions we should ask? You know, why major joint pain is important? What can be done? Whom to perform these interventions on? and which technique of interventional pain management. I think it's always important to ask these questions before you answer. You need to find out why it is important. Why do we want to manage patients uh, with major joint pain? You know? So this is the uh, interesting survey that I came across. This was done in Australia back in 2014. And they looked at the impact of arthritis on pain, quality of life, uh, you know, and what they realized, that they, they, you know, when they did the survey, they realized the quality of life for the patients who had osteoarthritis was very poor. They had very much limitation of function. Uh, they had increased medication use and, you know, that led to polypharmacy. They were taking many medications, which led to increased incidence of falls, 
you know, lack of balance, you know, joints giving away, uh, you know, stiffness in the joints, you know, mobility issues, increased use of health resources. So these patients actually, you know, went to their general practitioners, went to the hospital, you know, got hospitalized because of the falls, because of the pain. And, uh, you know, all of this uh, indirectly led to disability. So, you know, so the joint pain management is an important aspect because it, it can actually have an impact on various aspects of the life, including the quality of life and the function. Now, what can we do in general if you come across a patient with a joint pain? You can actually educate the patient. You can tell them why they have that pain. What is the reason? You can give them some lifestyle advice, you know, uh, with regards to their physical activity. Patients who are overweight, weight loss can certainly help. And uh, especially that's very much uh, in context with uh, high BMI patients with osteoarthritis of hip and knee. If they actually, you know, uh, do this kind of you know exercises and reduce the weight healthy eating diet then they can actually have a lesser pain uh, and that's proved by research so the other thing to keep in mind is you can refer them to the first line physical therapy treatment uh, you can give them some analgesics tense machine and the interventional pain management now in terms of the interventional pain management, I thought I'll put the slides, uh, which kind of, you know, are like basics of interventional pain management. So when you want to do an intervention, you need to find out, you need to make a correct diagnosis. Uh, you need to look for a pain generator. And it's not always easy to find a pain generator. There may be multiple pain generators. Uh, patient selection is a key. I think this is something that I want to stress because it's very easy to decide to do an injection, but it takes years to find who not to inject. And yet the important decision is whom not to inject. If patient is coming to you and they have psychological overlay, they have psychological comorbidities, then you know your interventions aren't gonna make a difference. They, you know, they you want to refer those patients for 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 psychological help before you can consider the intervention. So patient selection is an important uh, uh, important aspect and the precision in identifying targets. So when you talk about interventional pain management, you want to look at the targets and you want to get those targets precisely. Now, a few more principles of uh, interventional pain management. Be specific with hitting the targets with a needle positioning. It's very important because the general rule is right needle put in the right place and the right local anesthetic injected will always work right, okay, majority of times. So it's very important that people get appropriate hands-on training in order to achieve this, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the competency to, to do these procedures. Always check the needle position uh, and use the appropriate imaging modality. Now, if I give you simple examples that a lot of people use x-rays to do piriformis injection. Now, piriformis is a muscle. Why to use x-rays if ultrasound is the imaging modality that can show you the muscle. So that's that's the point. So you always use an appropriate imaging modality to, to do the procedure. The other thing to keep in mind, there may be more than one mechanisms of pain, uh, uh, you know, uh, that are playing the role. So your patient may have central sensitization. So it's very important that we keep that in mind when we're doing the interventions on these patients. Okay, so Options for joint pain management. What we could do is basically we can, as I said, we can give them medications like simple medications like paracetamol, anti-inflammatories. You can give them like, you know, uh, safer opiates uh, like buprenorphine, patch. You can refer them to physiotherapy, tense machine. You can do an intra-articular steroid injection. Now that's becoming a bit more debatable because, you know, uh, the debate is intra-articular steroids uh, over a period of time actually eat out the cartilage, it reduces the volume of the cartilage. So, you know, I think that's where the hyaluronic acid and the regenerative medicine side of things come in play. And, you know, the other option is the joint denervation procedures. Now, this is something that I've highlighted in red because this is something I want to talk to you guys uh, uh, today because there's been a lot of developments in this field recently and peripheral neuromodulation. So you could basically put uh, the electrical kind of, you know, signals around these nerves and you can modulate uh, and, and give the pain relief to the patient with major joint pain. Now, the next question that comes, so we've seen so far, you know, uh, why it's important. Now, whom to perform interventions on? So which are the patients you would consider for the interventions? 
So arthroplasty, not appropriate. And, you know, given that we live in a population, we live in an age where, you know, people are actually surviving at a, at a, at a later age, you know, an average age uh, in the UK is about like, you know, uh, 78 plus, you know, so people are basically, you know, uh, able to survive longer age. And, uh, but sometimes uh, the longer age survival has also got multiple comorbidities associated. And uh, sometimes these patients might not be able to undergo a, a hip or knee replacement or a shoulder replacement. So those kind of patients, you can consider these procedures. Uh, patients who do not want surgery, and you know, it, it all depends on the society and the patient's belief. A few patients would say, you know what, I can, I can live with pain, I don't want the surgery. So, you know, those kind of patients, you can consider this procedure. Patients who you think aren't going to be able to be undergoing surgery in a short term. So these are young patients, you know, patients who have early osteoarthritis, where surgeons have told you what, you're too early, you're too young to have a surgery, or patients who've got, you know, cartilage tear, and they've had a repair of cartilage, but still got the ongoing pain those kind of patients. And I think the joint interventions, the major joint denervation procedures are gonna be useful because of the COVID delays. You know, in, uh, in, in our country, national health, the, the, the system came to a complete stall uh, because of the COVID and all our joint replacement surgeries have been kept on hold and there's a long waiting list. And these patients are now gonna be, you know, looking at the options to help the pain uh, whilst they're undergoing a major surgery. So it's, it's going to be one of the options available for them. Uh, alternatives to pharmacological management. So a few patients do not want to take medications. They would rather have an injection. So those kind of patients, you can consider these procedures. And uh, patients who've had surgery, like joint replacement, but then still continue to have chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, those are the patients you can consider these interventions. Now, <clears throat> which techniques of intervention? So I'm talking about three major joints here shoulder joint, knee joint, and hip joint. So for shoulder joint, we knew that in the past we targeted suprascapular and axillary nerves, but there are these two nerves that have been recently being kind of, you know, studied quite in detail through cadaveric studies, the lateral pectoral nerve and lower subscapular nerve. So these are the, the nerves that needs to be targeted in addition to the suprascapular and axillary. And I'll tell you more details as we go along uh, later on. Now, uh, genicular nerve radiofrequency, the la this is a Latin word, genu means uh, knee. So genicular is the nerve supplying to the knee joint capsule. So that's something that you can do for the knee joint pain management. The other option is femoral and obturator and accessory obturator nerve for hip pain. So radio frequency of these nerves. Now, what we're gonna do over a period of next kind of, you know, uh, 35 minutes, uh, we, uh, we will talk through the anatomy of the nerve supply, what is the evidence and how to target these nerves using ultrasound and fluoroscopy and what's the practical approach? You know, I, I'm just going to give you my approach. Uh, you know, obviously there are various ways of doing things, but I'm gonna tell you how do I do it. So shoulder joint, we start with shoulder joint. Now, Jim just wanted to make sure that you still hear me, right? Jim, are you there? Jim? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Okay, brilliant, fantastic. Just wanna make sure that you guys are able to hear me. Yeah. Right, so shoulder pain, we start with shoulder pain. Now, lifetime prevalence is about 70%. Annual incidence is about 14.7 per 1,000 patients per year. So 40 to 50% of patients report persisting pain. So, you know, what I mean by that, if you have had a shoulder pain problem in your life, the issue is, you know, about 50% patients will tell you that the pain is still there. And there may be recurrence or exacerbation of their pain at 12 months. The recovery from shoulder pain is slow. The recurrence rate is about 25%. So it is a kind of a problem in terms of the patient's function. And, you know, patients are unable to function. They can't dress themselves properly or they want to have a shower. There are limitations. They can't open up the lid, you know, of the bottle. And then, you know, they, 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 they struggle to cook, they struggle to lift bags. So there are a lot of functional limitations for the shoulder pain. So when we talk about shoulder pain, what causes shoulder pain? You know, young people, you would find rotator cuff disorders, labral tears are common. Myofascial pain is also common in young people. Middle-aged people, adhesive capsulitis, Older age, you have then glenohumeral joint disorders, acromioclavicular joint disorders, and also chronic post-surgical pain is something that can come, uh, come along in any age. Now, 
shoulder joint, the pain generators are uh, capsules. Capsules have a lot of free nerve endings or nociceptors. Then you have ligaments, you have bursae, you have tendon, you have cartilage, you have muscles. So there's so many structures which are pain generators in shoulder. Now, anatomical considerations applicable to all these joints. So we know that all these joints have a lot of free nerve endings and they have a lot of structures, but all of these structures are supplied by the nerves. So when we talk about the nerves, uh, my guru, uh, my Prof. Bernard Morigal. So, you know, he told me this Hilton's law. So what is Hilton's law? The Hilton's law states that the joints in the body are innervated by the nerves, supplying the muscles across that joint. One, you know, simple example is if the knee joint, we talk about knee joint, the, the, the nerve to vastus medialis, nerves to vastus lateralis, nerve to vastus intermediate. So these are the nerves that are overgoing the knee joint. And these nerves then become genicular nerves, so superomedial, superolateral, intermediate. So all these major joints, hip joint, shoulder joint, all these joints, the nerves that are supplying to the muscle across the joint become the articular branches. They become purely sensory once they've given up the muscular branches. So that's a very important concept to keep in mind. And I think the reason I put that slide because when we go you know, across a few more slides, you will understand what I meant. So shoulder joint denervation or innervation of the shoulder joint, which nerves supply to this joint. Now, this is nothing new. This was described back in 1948 by a very, very like genius anatomist called Ernest Gardner from Michigan. Okay, and he, you know, gave this description. And then this actually then got restudied again in October, September, October in the RAPM article by Max Ekman from United States, a cadaveric study of articular branches of shoulder joint. And then another study came out by a Toronto group, Anna Gore, Philip Peng, John Tran. They did the study, 3D cadaveric needling placement and evaluation of suprascapular nerve. So what all these studies tell that the nerve supply of the shoulder joint is by four nerves, suprascapular nerve, axillary nerve, lateral pectoral nerve and lower subscapular nerve. Now, suprascapular nerve, as we all know, comes through the suprascapular notch. And then, you know, it supplies to the supraspinous fossa. There are some branches that go onto the joint. Then it goes through the spinal glenoid notch. It supplies to the infraspinous muscle and then also supplies to the uh, inferior part of the capsule posteriorly. Then we have axillary nerve coming off from the quadrangular space then it also supplies to the, the, the capsule posteriorly as well as anteriorly. The other nerve that I was telling you is the lateral pectoral nerve, which has recently been studied quite kind of, you know, uh, and it, they found that, you know, many cadaveric specimens showed that this nerve is persistently there supplying to the anterior part of the joint capsule as well as the acromioclavicular joint. And the lower subscapular nerve is a nerve that also supplies to the anterior part of the joint capsule. So this paper from <coughs> Toronto Group, what they showed that these are the nerves and they've actually done a 3D mapping of these nerves. So the yellow color is the acromial branch of the, the, the lateral pectoral nerve. You've got blue, the light blue is inferior branch of the suprascapular nerve, that's super branch of suprascapular nerve. So you've got all these nerves and they're mapped out and they realized that all these nerves have kind of, you know, anterior, posterior uh, kind of, you know, innervation. And they put it in this diagram here. So the anterior part, the joint capsule, they divided it into anterior superior quadrant, posterior superior quadrant, anterior inferior quadrant, and posterior inferior quadrant. So if you come across a patient who comes to you with a pain in the posterior part of the shoulder joint, then the nerve you want to target will be suprascapular. If they complain of pain, not just the superior quadrant, but inferior quadrant, you would like to target suprascap and axillary. If they complain of just isolated pain in the anterior part of the shoulder, which is very rare, majority of times you'll come across patients who say, my pain is global, all across various quadrants. So the anterior superior quadrant, you have suprascapular nerve, lateral pectoral nerve, and the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. And the anterior inferior quadrant, you have axillary nerve, lateral pectoral nerve, and the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. So these are these were the kind of occurrence of the nerves. And you could see the posterior cord of brachial plexus is very, very small contribution. But then you have subscapularis nerve, lateral pectoral nerve, axillary nerve, lateral pectoral nerve supplies to the anterior part of the shoulder. Okay, so I think the relevance here is this bit. Now, in the past, we always did what we call the pulse radio frequency. So we put the needle at the notch 
and we did 42 degree temperature rise of the needle in order to catch these nerves. What they're recommending is rather than doing pulse radio frequency, you put the needle in the middle between your suprascapular notch and the spinoglenoid notch and do a conventional radio frequency. Now, what's the difference between conventional radio frequency and pulse radio frequency? Pulse radio frequency, you do 42 degree rise in temperature and there are pulses of radio frequency and you basically aren't going to cause any kind of you know, uh, thermocoagulation. But with the conventional radio frequency, you raise the temperature to 80 degrees for 90 seconds. So you basically do cause some thermocoagulation. So, you know, the, the, in the past, we were worried that if you do a, a conventional radio frequency, you know, you're going to get a weakness of supraspinatus and infraspinatus. But what they're recommending, if you do a, what we call the midpoint technique, then you can basically, you know, spare this medial trunk of the suprascapular nerve. And you can basically get all the articular branches going to the shoulder joint, which is kind of a pointer with my pointer here. So that's what they're recommending. So that's the that's the kind of their recommendation. So conclusions are shoulder joint, articular branches of suprascapular nerve and axillary nerve insert into the capsule overlying the glenohumeral joint posteriorly. So that's the major joint supply. You know, you do have anteriorly axillary nerve that supplies to the inferior part, but the lateral pectoral nerve and, and the lower scapular nerve uh, are, are actually contributing to the anterior joint uh, capsule. The conventional notch technique, which I just talked about, uh, you know, captured both lateral as well as medial trunks, where if you do a midpoint technique, you can capture only the lateral trunk, which will spare your supraspinatus muscle. And the relevance is do the conventional radio frequency in the suprascapular of the suprascapular nerve in the supraspinous fossa at the midpoint. Now, if you are not clear about that, a few more slides will make this much more clear. But well, what's the evidence? Is there any evidence of these procedures? Okay, so this is a recent kind of an article this year, January came out on systematic review and meta-analysis of radio frequency procedures on shoulder joint. Okay, this is also from Toronto. Now, what they found, radio frequency treatments targeting sensory innervation of the shoulder joint affected by the degenerative conditions have potential to reduce pain, okay? And they talked about basically pulsed RF and what they're saying, they only reduce the pain, but it does not suggest a uh, functional benefit. So the people's function doesn't improve. And what they're suggesting is high methodological studies are needed. Okay. So that's, that's something that that's come out of that systematic review. So we have talked about the anatomy. We've talked about the, the, uh, the sort of evidence, and now we're going to go on to the practical approach. So what do we do? Options we have, we could do suprascapular nerve block, axillary nerve block, lateral pectoral nerve block, and lower subscapular nerve block. Now, before you do any of these blocks, there is a two-step process that I use in my practice. The first step is use a local anesthetic. So target suprascapular nerve or axillary nerve with local anesthetic. And, you know, sometimes you can use local anesthetic and steroid, but the problem is when you add steroids, it makes the picture more muddy. So I've actually changed my practice. And since COVID-19, I've gone away from steroids. So now I only use local anesthetic as a step one. If they find the local anesthetic injections have benefited, then I go ahead and do a radio frequency treatment. So what outcomes I look for? I look for reduction in pain score, look for improved range of movements, improved shoulder function, increased Oxford shoulder score, and patient satisfactions. All these are the things I look for. So once I've done the block, before I do the block, I ask them to move the shoulder. I'll assess how much shoulder movement is there. I'll do the block and I'll assess the shoulder movements after I've done the block. And I use one person lidocaine in my practice because it kicks in quickly and I get to know whether my block has been successful. Okay, so that's, that's something that I do. And I give them a pain diary and you will be surprised even local anesthetic injections can last for good one week. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. And you ask the patient to fill in the details, like are they able to sleep better? Are they able to lie on that side better? Are they able to, you know, function better? Are they able to open the bottle's lid? Are they able to kind of, you know, uh, you know, have a shower properly? So, you know, you give them an Oxford score. And if there is an improvement in the Oxford score, then I consider them for radio frequency treatment. Now, how do we target these nerves? So a practical approach. Ultrasound guidance, you put the ultrasound probe 
And I usually start at the spine of the scapula and then I move the probe in and I look for the suprascapular fossa. And this is what you will see. You will see the trapezius muscle, supraspinous muscle. And basically, you know, if you tilt the probe looking at the suprascapular notch, then you'll be able to get the neurovascular bundle where you will see suprascapular nerve along with the artery and the nerve. So that's the suprascapular nerve block. And nowadays I don't perform the block in the notch area. I just put the needle down and put five cc's of 1% lidocaine in that region to perform suprascapular nerve block. The axillary nerve block is kind of, you know, another simple way to find it is you feel for the head of the humerus. You put the ultrasound probe on the top of the head of the humerus. You move down and you look for deltoid muscle. You look for the triceps tapering off teres minor and you look for the arterial pulsations these are the pulsations of posterior circumflex humeral artery which points you towards the axillary nerve and sometimes you can actually pick up the axillary nerve nicely but you know once you get this structure i do out of plane i bring the needle and i basically go next to the artery and i inject two cc's of local anesthetic for the axillary nerve so suprascapular nerve and axillary nerve now, if you want to do a conventional radio frequency, I was telling you guys that, you know, you do midpoint technique. Now, how do you go at the midpoint technique to, to catch the, you know, suprascapular nerve? When you start at the notch, the, at the notch, you will see this kind of structure along with the suprascapular ligament. But when you move away from the notch, you will find the notch becomes like shallow and you're actually on the fossa at the midpoint. So you start here, it will give you structure like that. Then you go at the midpoint, it will give you structure like that. And if you go carrying on scanning laterally, you will get the spinal glenoid notch. So this is your target at the midpoint. So if you bring the needle out of plane and put the needle target, conventional radio frequency, 80 degrees, 90 seconds, you will spare the medial trunk. So you will spare the supraspinatus muscle and you will get the uh, the infraspinatus muscle, as well as the branches supplying to the to the uh, uh, shoulder joint capsule. So that's that's how I I would do a, a conventional radio frequency of suprascapular nerve only if I want to just do a suprascapular nerve RF. Then lateral pectoral nerve. You could target this nerve as you would do. You scan it anteriorly. You put your ultrasound probe anteriorly, and you look for the humeral head and you move the probe medially and look for the coracoid process and it's basically on the top of the coracoid process. You will bring your needle in in plane and you target that lateral pectoral nerve. I always do motor stimulation because if you have motor branches, then you would probably park the needle slightly more inferiorly. The advantage of using ultrasound, it makes you safe. You know, it's less likely that you'll give a pneumothorax because you know where your needle is going. Now, you could actually use fluoroscopy to target these nerves. You could do conventional uh, you know, radio frequency using fluoroscopy. And I'm putting this picture, this is the AP view and looking at the humeral head, you've got your anatomical neck, you've got your surgical neck of the humerus, you've got your glenoid fossa, coracoid process. Now this is very important because these, this is gonna be our target for your lateral pectoral nerve. And this is gonna be our target for the lower subscapular nerve. So I'm just going to go forward and I'm going to show you this. This is a, just a schematic diagram from the shoulder looking from anterior to posterior. You've got labrum, humeral head, coracoid process, acromioclavicular joint, acromion and clavicle. And our targets are going to be this bit here, the, the coracoid process, but the inferior portion of the inferior lateral portion of the coracoid process and also the sort of, you know, uh, medial portion of the, of the uh, glenoid. Uh, where you're going to have the, uh, the, the lower subscapular. So this is, this is the radiological targets for the lateral pectoral nerve and the lower subscapular nerve. Now, moving on to next is how do you target axillary and suprascapular nerve if you want to do a conventional RF? So one option is you could do it at the midpoint, but that's only for suprascapular. But if you want to do axillary as well as suprascapular both, this is alternative options. So you're catching these nerves very much close to the capsule. So you're basically trying to de you know, prevent the denervation of your muscles, supraspinatus and infraspinatus, because you're going way away. And as I said, with the Hilton's law, once they've given up the muscular branches, the rest of the branches are articular. And this is what I was meaning. So closer you target these nerves to the joints, less likely you'll have a more muscle weakness because the motor branches have already been given off. So this is going to be your radiological target 
for your suprascapular nerve here and the axillary nerve here. This is basically your greater tuberosity, just below the greater tuberosity. You'll park these two needles. You can do a bipolar lesion. Same way you can do a bipolar lesion here for the suprascapular nerve. So we've covered the anterior part, lateral pectoral nerve, lower subscapular nerve. Posteriorly, you can co co cover the suprascapular nerve and axillary nerve. And this is just showing you the x-ray position. So here, basically head end of the patient underneath the drip here, patient is prone. You've actually moved the uh, C arm towards you and oblique. And when you do x-rays, you're gonna get this kind of view. And this is basically targeting the, the suprascapular nerve. This is a diagnostic block. Uh, picture, uh, you know, if you do a, a, a cooled RF or a bipolar RF, you will have to park two needles uh, in the same location. This is the diagnostic block uh, picture with using the radio, uh, the fluoroscopy uh, and uh, showing you the articular branches of the, of the uh, uh, axillary nerve. Now, once you're done with that, then you have to flip the patient supine to do the lateral pectoral branch and uh, the, the image will be, you will do an oblique and ipsilateral image. And this is what the picture you're gonna get. So that's the coracoid process. And you're parking the needle at the inferior part of the, inferior lateral part of the coracoid process. And that's for your lateral articular, lateral pectoral nerve, articular branch to the shoulder joint. So that's basically the shoulder joint kind of, you know, uh, denervation. So the new thing in the shoulder joint, just don't block suprascapular nerve. You have other nerves to target, and that's the only way you'll get a better coverage of pain. Uh, so you can target the axillary nerve, you can target the lower subscapular, you can also target the lateral pectoral nerve. So shoulder joint pain is what, this is new in the shoulder joint pain. Now knee joint pain. So prevalence is about 46%. Meniscal tear, ligamental injury are very common in young adults. Osteoarthritis is common as the age increases. So it's elderly population, osteoarthritis incidence is higher. Prevalence is actually higher in women as compared to men. And knee pain leads to loss of work productivity and disability. So, you know, people are not able to actually walk better. You know, they're in pain and they lose their function. They lose their work productivity. And there is an incidence of about 15 to 35% chronic post-surgical pain. Okay, so patients who undergo knee surgery, there is an incidence that 15 to 35% patients will continue to have pain in spite of having a knee replacement. So that's, that's, a, that's a big number. And I think people need to be informed of this number because it's not that every knee replacement is gonna be successful. Patients may be left with some knee pain even after undergoing a knee replacement. Okay, so moving on to next. So anatomy of nerve supply, evidence, ultrasound targets, fluoroscopy targets, and the practical approach. So that's what I'm gonna tell you in the knee joint. Now, anatomy. This is also not new. This was also described back in, you know, uh, uh, back in uh, kind of the days when Ernest Gardner wrote the, the, the article on the innervation of the knee joint uh, pain, 1948. Uh, and this, these are the nerves that supply the anterior part of the joint capsules. Nerve to vastus medialis, nerve to vastus sort of, you know, uh, lateralis. Then you've got your nerve to vastus intermedius, which is in the middle. And then you've got your inferior medial genicular nerve. You've got a recurrent uh, peroneal nerve becoming the recurrent genicular nerve and inferior lateral genicular nerve. So that's the anterior nerve supply. Posterior nerve supply, you have got the branches from the tibial, common peroneal, and you've got your posterior obturator nerve. They all form a plexus and supplies to the posterior joint capsule. And they also go anteriorly and merge here as a recurrent uh, 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 genicular nerve, inferior lateral genicular nerve. So there's a huge plexus and cross innervation of these nerves. So when you talk about knee joint pain, I ask the patient, where is your pain? If patient says my pain is in the back of the knee, you're going to find it difficult to give them any relief by doing these nerve blocks. These nerve blocks, as well as radio frequency, only help if they have anterior knee pain because these nerves supply to majority of the anterior joint capsule. Posteriorly, you have a plexus, which is difficult to target. So anterior joint capsule, target these nerves. So six nerves are said, superomilateral, superomedial, inferomedial, and these are the three commonly performed ones. Then you have lateral recurrent branch, inferolateral. We don't target these, and this is something new I will tell you later on, because these nerves are very co very close to common peroneal nerve, and people are concerned that patients may get a foot drop. So that's why we always target these commonly, superolateral, superomedial, and inferomedial. 
and a lot of people now are targeting intermediate. Now, we know from the, the study from Franco on cadaveric study, a cadaveric dissection, that these nerves have variable proximal trajectories. What I mean that their location varies proximally, but they have a distal consistent point where, you know, uh, they, the, is, and the point is the, the junction of the shaft and the condyle. And I, what I mean by that, and I'll show that to you in a minute, is if you look at this image here, this is the femoral shaft and that's the femoral condyle. And you can consistently find these nerves in the cadavers at this junction, okay? So junction of the shaft and the condyle, same here, junction of the shaft and the condyle, junction of the shaft and the condyle of the tibia. So that's a tibial condyle, that's a shaft. So if you actually put the needles at these locations, you're more likely to target these nerves as compared to going proximally. Now, other things that we were doing that we were parking these needles in the middle of the sort of, you know, lateral view, middle of the shaft, of the, of the femur and the middle of the shaft of the tibia. Now, what's new then, you know, what has changed over a period of time? So there are a few papers that have recently come out which looked at the innovation again. And what they found is the branches of vastus intermedius then gets divided into two. It gets divided into lateral branch and the medial branch. The medial branch then goes and supplies to the medial joint capsule along with the so, sort of, you know, superior medial genicular nerve. So, so far what we were targeting, we were targeting the medial branch of the uh, sort of, you know, in, uh, vastus intermedius. The lateral branch goes and supplies to the lateral part of the joint capsule, but you also have a separate uh, nerve, which is the lateral genicular nerve. So let me show you a bit more pictures and that will make things more clear. So this is what we were targeting so far, okay? And what they say that this is actually the medial branch of the, vastus intermedius, if you want to truly target the uh, superolateral, uh, sorry, superomedial genicular nerve, you need to go inferiorly and posteriorly. And the landmark here is the adductor tubercle. So this is something new. So the new technique, just don't park the needle there and do the radio frequency. You have to park another needle more inferiorly on the top of the adductor tubercle and posteriorly to get these branches of the superomedial genicular nerve. Another new thing here, this is the lateral side. So basically you're looking at the superolateral genicular nerve that gets further divided into deep branch, superficial branch and intermediate branch. But then this was conventionally what we were doing. We were targeting this particular point and what it did, it only got us the lateral branch of the vastus intermediate. So as I said, the nerve to vastus intermediate then further divides into medial branch and the lateral branch. So whatever we were doing, we were just only targeting that nerve. We were missing this point. This is the point to go for catching the superolateral genicular nerve. The supero inferomedial genicular nerve, it gets divided into anterior branch, posterior branch, and intermediate branch. And this is where we were targeting the nerve, which is the right thing to do, the middle part of the shaft of the uh, uh, tibia. So, Putting all that in context, you know, this was our old target. This is the new target. So just don't park the needle there. You also have to park another needle just above the adductor tubercle. We were only parking needle here on the lateral side. You don't park just there. You go posteriorly and you do the legioning posteriorly to get your superolateral branch of the genicular nerve. Then inferomedial, the target still stays the same. Okay, and that's the inferolateral kind of, you know, genicular, recurrent genicular nerve. And this is something that's new as well. People are now targeting this nerve at the widest part of the fibula. So you use the x-ray and you put your needle there and you can cause a lesion at that point to get the recurrent genicular nerve. Now, what's the evidence of all these blocks? It all started back in 2011. This was a RCT from uh, uh, Choi, uh, which said that not only it improved people's pain, it improved Oxford knee score, it improved their function. So, and then the recent narrative review by uh, my colleagues, uh, sort of, you know, Leo, you know, you know um, and friends, Leo Caporal, they've done the cool radio frequency on the patients uh, and they found that it actually improves the pain relief as well as function as compared to local anesthetic and steroid injections for the knee osteoarthritis. 
So there is a good evidence supporting that, and it's RCTs supporting that. Now, practical approach, how do I do it? And I, we, we actually at Gulf Pain School teach this technique called combined ultrasound and fluoroscopy technique or cuff technique, and that's what I do. So my technique is try and see if patient can do figure of four. So, you know, I usually mark the, lay, mark the knee, put the drape underneath, clean the area, treat this like somebody's undergoing a knee replacement, okay? Because antisepsis is very important, you know, because you're dealing with joints. And the rule is, if there is an infection in the joint, it doesn't go away, okay? So you would rather avoid it in the first place. So try your best to do full, full antisepsis, clean the area properly, have gown, glove, mask, you know, because you, you, know, you don't want to invite any infection. Now you drape the area, after you've draped. Now you look at this setup here. This is what my setup is. So I'll have an ultrasound machine parked opposite. I'll have the x-ray machine parked opposite and then I'll clean all the area and then I'll drape that. Once it's all draped, then I will do another cleaning again. The reason for that is that's just before my needle insertion. I've done one more clean because that way you've done a double prep. Now this is what I use in terms of the drugs. So lignocaine as a local anesthetic, you rarely give any sedation to the patient. The whole procedure can be done under local anesthetic, but judicious amount of local anesthetic. This is something that I've ditched out now, steroids. I don't use steroids after the radio frequency. And you can see the radio frequency needles. I use a straight needles, not a curved needles. And that's a radio frequency electrode. So you put the needle, then you put the electrode into the needle and you heat up the needle. So that's what we do. And this is the ultrasound probe put into the ultrasound probe cover or the sleeve. And this is how we start the setup. So you could see the gel already. And then I'll start to scan. This is a radio frequency machine parked on the same side. So I can operate the radio frequency machine. And this is the, this is a start. You look for the, the junction of the shaft and the condyle. So that's the femoral shaft and that's the condyle. And so I'll bring this in the middle of the probe. And then, you know, I use a marker pen to mark the skin. Once I've done the marking, this is just showing you the inferomedial. You can see the artery nicely. This is the tibial condyle. That's the tibial shaft. So we bring the needle down in this area for the diagnostic block. For radio frequency, what I do, I mark the, mark the skin again. And then we put the probe in the transverse view so that we are targeting the same area, but the needle is gonna go in plane, okay? So this is how you position the needle in plane using the ultrasound on the top of the junction of the shaft of the tibia and the condyle of the tibia. Same way shaft of the uh, femur and the condyle of the femur. That will be another needle that will be parked there. So once you park the needle, then we do the x-rays and you could see the, the, the x-ray. This is the AP view showing the junction of the shaft and the condyle. Same here, junction of the shaft and the condyle. And that's the AP view. And then I do the lateral view. So this is a lateral x-ray and just showing you the needle is basically in the middle of the shaft in the condyle junction. And this is something that I've changed now. I do another lesion in the lateral position and I put a needle just inferiorly closer to the adductor tubercle, you know, and cause another lesion. So that's new, okay? That's something that I've changed the practice since looking at all these papers. This is the lateral view for the, the inferomedial genicular nerve radio frequency. You have got the tibia and that's the mid, midpoint of the shaft and the condyle junction, okay? So that's how I do the radio frequency for the knee joint. Uh, Jim, are we all okay so far? I've got another 10, 15 minutes to wrap up. Yeah, just go ahead. We have all Fantastic, your... lovely. Right, so we've seen the shoulder joint, seen the hip joint, and now we're gonna go to, sort of seen the knee joint and we're gonna go on to the hip joint. Now hip joint, the incidence is about 30 to 40% in young adults who play sports. So surprisingly very high. Labral tear, synovitis, ileosos tendinitis, all of these can cause pain in the young adults. Uh, incidence of hip pain is about 12 to 15% in the adults over the age of 60 years. And older population, you're gonna have problems of greater trochanter pain syndrome and osteoarthritis. Now, what are the pain generators in hip? You've got ligaments, you've got bursae, you've got muscles, you've got tendons, and the joint capsule. All of these can generate the pain. So we're gonna go through what nerve supply to the hip joint, evidence, ultrasound targets, neuroscopy targets, and the practical approach. Now, nerve supply, as I said, not, not new, 
It all was described by Gardner back in 1948. And this is where the figures. So the nerves that supply to the anterior part of the joint capsule, branches of the femoral nerve and branches of the obturator nerve. The nerve supply to the posterior part of the joint capsule will be nerve to quadratus femoris. And you've got you, you know, the uh, superior gluteal nerve. So these are the two nerves that supply to the posterior part of the joint capsule. Another picture that was described back in 1976, showing you the posterior part of the nerve supply. You've got nerve to quadratus femoris, you know, and then you've got uh, a superior gluteal nerve. So this is what, the, what they've done is basically piriformis muscle, you can see, and that's, that's, that's what is showing you that this particular nerve supplies to the, uh, the, the posterior part of the joint capsule of the, of the hip. And uh, they've actually restudied this again, uh, uh, and there is a new paper out uh, from the same group who did their studies on the shoulder, Max Ekman, and they found that the nerve to quadratus femoris is very kind of common nerve supplying the posterior part of the joint capsule. So nerve supply, these are the nerves that you would target, femoral nerve, obturator nerve, and accessory obturator nerve. And that's basically going to target it anteriorly. Now these nerves, we rarely target them, but they are studying this nerve, nerve to quadratus femoris, which is what they think could be a potential target uh, for the for the hip joint pain. So the paper from uh, Toronto, my guru uh, Philip Peng uh, and uh, and uh, what and Mike Gofell uh, and Agar. So they actually did an anatomical study for innervation of the anterior hip joint capsules. So what they found, they found the nerves so the nerves that supply to anterior joint capsule are the articular branches of femoral nerve, which shows in yellow here. Then you've got accessory obturator nerve, and then you have the obturator nerve. And they found that these, ne these nerves supply to the majority of the joint capsule anteriorly. Just a schematic diagram showing you femoral nerve, obturator nerve, and then posteriorly you've got sciatic nerve branches, a nerve to obturator, uh, quadratus femoris, and superior gluteal nerve. Now, uh, Vincent Rock has a really good video on the Peng block. And I think, you know, a really nice kind of schematic diagrams from that is, you know, superomedial quadrant, you've got femoral nerve and accessory obturator nerve. You've got lateral quadrant, you've got femoral nerve. You've got inferior quadrant, you've got femoral nerve and obturator nerve. And you've got inferomedial quadrant, you've got femoral nerve, obturator nerve, and accessory obturator nerve. Now, why this figure is important? Because majority of the nociceptive component of the hip joint pain is anteriorly, and majority of the proprioception part of the joint is posteriorly. So you could target all these nerves and you can ask the patient where their pain is. If they're complaining of pain in the medial aspect in the groin, you want to target all these nerves. If they complain of greater trochanter area pain and the pain in the outer aspect of the groin, then you can target only femoral nerve, okay? So, and, and the obturator nerve. So this is what I meant. Anterior capsule, femoral obturator and, and accessory obturator nerve. Posterior capsule, you've got sacral plexus, you've got nerve to quadratus femoris and superior gluteal nerve. And as I said, posterior capsule has more kind of, you know, uh, uh, proprioceptual component. Anterior capsule has more kind of nociceptive component. So that's why we always target the nerves anteriorly and, you know, ignore the posterior part. So the innovation, as I said, the articular branches, you want to target femoral nerve if they have greater trochanteric pain, obturator nerve if they've got groin pain or thigh pain. If you're talking about the gluteal pain, you know, difficult to target these nerves. You know, you can do pulse radio frequency. There are case reports, but you know, the upper gluteal pain, you could target superior gluteal nerve. And if they're complaining a lower gluteal pain, it's nerve to quadratus femoris. Okay, so evidence. Now, what is the evidence? This is another good narrative review from Anuj Bhatia. And, and Philip Peng talking about the radio frequency procedures for chronic hip pain and uh, ultrasound targets. Well, how do we manage, you know, manage to do these blocks? So this is a very good illustration from Nysura. This is the illustration for Peng block. Now Peng block and the diagnostic block for the femoral and obturate, accessory obturator nerve are not very different. It's the volume. So what you do, you start at the anterior superior iliac spine, then you move down anterior inferior iliac spine and you line up the probe this way. And you're gonna be basically focusing this particular area called iliopubic eminence. So that's your anterior inferior iliac spine. And this is the iliopubic eminence. And that's where you have your source tendon. If you bring the needle and park here, you're gonna get the femoral article branches. If you bring the needle and park here, you're going to get the accessory obturator nerve branches. So this is what I meant. The ultrasound image showing you 
parking the probe in the groin, looking at the iliopubic eminence, IPE, source tendon, iliosource muscle, you've got anterior inferior iliac spine, and that's your iliosource notch. So if you bring the needle in plane, the things to keep in mind, you don't want to damage the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of thigh because that's basically very much close to the ASIS. So always have a look at that, make sure you, you avoid that, bring the needle, park the needle here, two mLs of local anesthetic, you get the femoral nerve, and if I bring the needle here and park the needle here and put two mLs, that will get your accessory obturator nerve. So that's how you will look for the flow. Now, if you want to do a pen block, you will inject like 20 to 30 cc's of local anesthetic just below the ileal source tendon and you lift off the tendon. And what you're going to get is good amount of spread, which will catch all the nerves, accessory obturator, obturator, and femoral nerve. But we only targeting femoral and accessory obturator with very low amount of local for a diagnostic purpose. Now, next bit to target is the obturator nerve. So, how do we target the obturator nerve? You do it as you would do for a hip joint injection. You know, you look for acetabulum, femoral head, femoral neck, and then you move the probe more medially. This is what you're gonna do, and then you're gonna lose. You're gonna lose your acetabulum. You're gonna just get the femoral. You know, you're gonna lose your femoral head. You're gonna just see the acetabulum. And if you bring the needle and park it at the inferior portion of the acetabulum, that corresponds to your this area called teardrop. Teardrop on the X-ray. So this is a radiological finding. It's the inferior acetabulum or incisura acetabulum. And you want to park the needle on the lateral side of the teardrop, not on the medial side, because that's where you have motor branches going to the adductor muscles, because that's what your obturator foramen is. So the obturator nerve comes and gives the branches, the motor branches, and the needle needs to be parked laterally. And always do motor stimulation before you do the radio frequency. Now, what are the fluoroscopy targets? Fluoroscopy targets are as I showed you, you can use the x-rays only to do these procedures. I won't recommend x-rays only because you can actually have vascular damage. So I always use cuff technique, combined ultrasound and fluoroscopy technique. So this is where you have, you have your needle going to the teardrop. If you bring the needle on the top of the acetabulum, you'll get the femoral articular branches. This is for the obturator branches. So... So acknowledgements to Dr. Philip Peng, Dr. Vincent Rocks, Dr. Amar Salti, and the NYSURA for, for their images and their papers. Uh, you know, I've, I've looked through them, I've studied them, and that's what I'm sharing my knowledge with you. Now I'm just gonna summarize this. So when you're talking about shoulder joint, radio frequency treatment is an option for patients who are poor surgical candidates and have multiple comorbidities. The target nerves include suprascapular, axillary, lateral pectoral, and lower subscapular nerve. Radio frequency treatment is an option. You can do a pulse radio frequency or you can do a conventional radio frequency and peripheral nerve stimulation is also an option for these nerves. Knee joint, you can target superomedial, superolateral and inferomedial genicular nerve radio frequency. You use ultrasound to a diagnostic block, but when you're doing a radio frequency, I would suggest you do combine ultrasound and fluoroscopy targets and take the targets that the adductor tubercle is a new target. Go posteriorly on the lateral side to get the superolateral genicular nerves. And there is also an inferolateral genicular nerve as a new target. The failure rate is about 30 to 40 percent. And the reason for that is a wrong target. So far, we've been doing just you know, the, uh, we've been missing so many nerves. And I think that's why we, you know, we've been getting failure rate. The other reason to fail, fail is unable to denervate the post plexus of the capsule and chemical denervation with alcohol and phenol is possible. And uh, with regards to the hip, uh, articular branches of femoral obturator and accessory obturator nerve radio frequency is an option. Uh, I would always recommend using ultrasound and fluoroscopy technique for the RF. Large lesions or bipolar lesions improve the catching of the nerves because these nerves are multiple branches. So if you make a big lesion, you will catch many nerves. And also in this area, chemical denervation using alcohol or phenol is possible. And there's a group in Hong Kong. I think Tony has been doing a lot of studies. Uh, Tony NG has been doing a lot of studies. And, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he is the guy who's done maximum hour work on the, on the phenol. So coming soon on the Gulf Pain School, we have anatomy, sononatomy masterclass 
by Prof. Moragel from Austria. Uh, he will also do the live demos. We have kept the course content, very practical indications, anatomy, surface anatomy, ultrasound propositioning. So all the, de all the lectures are recorded. Uh, we, we, this is Prof. Moragel. He is basically the godfather of anatomy and sononatomy. He's been written, writing lots of books and uh, he's, he's an excellent teacher. And uh, you know, the anatomy, sononatomy masterclass will have four parts upper limb, lower limb, thorax, abdomen, and then you've got spine, which will include so thoracic, cervical, uh, lumbar, and sacrum. And then we have a cadaver course that's coming up. That's a face-to-face -face as well as a, a hybrid event. We're gonna have a virtual course as well. So 26, we are running a course on the spine and 27th, we are running a course on the major joints. And it's gonna be taking place at the Gulf Medical University in Ajman and we're gonna have fluoroscopy and ultrasound guided procedures. Now, obviously there are travel restrictions. That's, our, that's why we're doing a virtual event. So all the cadaveric needling that we will do, we will also you know, telecast that on a different date. So this is basically the, the flyer for the, for, the, for the cadaver course. Now, this is what we specialize, procedure specific evidence-based image guidance. So we will not teach you piriformis injection using X-ray, we'll teach you piriformis injection using ultrasound. We'll teach you cervical medial branch using ultrasound, RF using X-ray. So we'll teach you what's evidence-based. This is the uh, cadaver course flyer for 27th of March. And all the details are on Gulf Pain School's website. We've got Pelvic Pain Symposium that's coming on 7th of March. That's coming Sunday. And if you are interested, do join us. Uh, it's four CPD points from Royal College. It's a very good collaborative effort between Royal Society of Medicine, Gulf Pain School and Leicester Pain Education and University College London Hospital. So this is the flyer for the pelvic pain management. And it's, it's something that people you know, don't know that much, but I think there's plenty that you could do for patients with pelvic pain. We've got webinars on uh, pain education. As uh, Jim mentioned, I've been working hard to have a big library of all these educational resources. So we've got lots of webinars that we've done and they all are available on Painflix. So similar to Netflix, we, we, are, we are basically launching Painflix on 20th of March, uh, which will be our website with full amount of video content uh, for you guys to, to access. So, and this is our YouTube channel, uh, Lester Pain Education, where you have quite a lot of other educational uh, material that's available. And we've got a playlist and you could see that we have divided the playlist in lumbar spine, lower limb blocks, peripheral nerve, upper limb blocks, you know, thoracic trunkle blocks. So I've gone through loads of YouTube videos and I've selected the good ones out. And we've also got, you know, basic pain training um, uh, videos as well. So, you know, do, do subscribe. It's free. It doesn't cost you. And thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate you guys giving your time. Right, Jim, I'm done. That was a, a long run through, but it was difficult to cover all the topics in a short period of time. So, but I've tried my best. I'm so disappointed, Dr. Sadiq. Why is that? Because you stopped right away. <laughs> 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 that was a great lecture, Dr. Sadiq. Thank you. So Thanks I, a lot. I Thank really you. appreciate uh, all the information that you have shared to us. Uh, anyway, uh, I, may, I, I would just want to probably uh, ask you two, one or two questions because I know sure, sure. it's a very long lecture, so I, I wouldn't want sure, to. Sure. Your... No, no worries. No worries. No okay. Worries. This is from uh, the great Abdallah. Yes. You know, you know Abdallah? You know Abdallah. Very well. I don't know yeah. him. I don't know him. Yeah. Abdallah, <laughs> why don't you just speak up? Okay, know. so what he's saying, Abdullah, <laughs> are you there? Abdullah is saying, if you are in a situation... Yeah. Dr. Sadiq, you are welcome. <laughs> nice to see you here. You, nice, nice to see you, you Abdullah. Just speak, nice up. You. speak up, Dr. Abdullah. So, yes, tell me, Abdullah, yeah. what was, what's your question? I can read it here. Uh, okay. uh, uh, between uh, radio frequency of the uh, joint nerves or intra-articular... Uh, uh, between and toxin, what will you choose and why? So, put it this way, I think uh, intra-articular botulinum toxin is something that I've not used in my practice. And, uh, you know, I mean, there is an evidence, but I think currently the evidence on, you know, use of radiofrequency treatment for the nerves is much higher. You know, there are plenty of RCTs 
which back up. So any treatment strategy you want to use, you need to find out, is it safe? Is it being practiced well in the various parts of the world? Is there enough evidence? Does it improve not just the pain, but the function? That's another important bit to keep in mind. I mean, you can give them pain relief, but if they're not able to move their arm, then that's no good. You want to make sure when you do a block, the block has been followed by improved functional outcomes. So gone those days when we were just doing pain scores, you know, if you take any good article and submit to a journal and it just focuses on pain scores, they'll check it out of the window. They'll say, you know what, what's, what's the functional improvement? Has the patient managed to sleep better? Has the patient managed to reduce their medications better? Has the patient managed to walk better or, you know, or use their shoulder better? So you want to improve the functional, you know, functional side of things. And I think for radio frequency treatment, given that there's a good evidence, that's what I would choose instead of a, instead of a Botox. Because, you know, number one is I haven't used Botox in my practice for the joints. I use Botox but for other conditions, not for intra-articular uh, injections. And number two is there is, because there is a good evidence for the radio frequency, I would go for radio. Okay, that's, that's thank you that's very much, dear. No, okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. you very much, dear doctor, thank for you. your uh, comprehensive. No, thank you so much, Abdullah. Thanks for attending. Thank, thank you for you. the prince, the prince of Egypt. Yeah. That's the, the, the prince of Egypt, uh, Dr. Sadiq. Welcome. That's from the Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> I think he had some problems with his connection, so that's why we could yeah. hear him, and then you know got disconnected. That's, right. That so, was very. That was a very, very excellent lecture. I cannot uh, think of a of a question because that was just too good for me. No, thank you so much, uh, uh, Jim. It was thank you for an opportunity. Yeah. And I uh, look forward to see you in person in future. You think your work is done? I will give you more work to do. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is good. I'm, I'm, I'm liking it. I'm I'll liking it. Oh, it. Think of another day. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sadiq uh, gives uh, fruitful knowledge and skills uh, yeah. to physiatrists. I think most of uh, attendants to uh, Dr. Jim uh, webinars are physiatrists and Dr. Sadiq will help uh, us Definitely. to uh, understand better uh, the pain uh, physician approach to manage uh, different pain conditions. He is an Look, excellent exhibit. I love to listen to him. Now who's rotating, she's a physiatrist. So we call it the rehab medicine in the UK. And I told her, you know what, you're doing an attachment with us. And I want you to make the list of clinical conditions that you want to manage it effectively. So she's given me the list. And I think shoulder is something that's very much kind of an issue for physiatrists. And she works in a spinal unit as well. So she, she gave me a list of conditions. She said, well, I want to do these kind of procedures <laughs> to help patients. I said, fine, you know, I'll help you out. So why not? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sadek. Thank you, Abdullah. Thank you, Dr. Thank Dr. you, Thank you very Sadiq, much. One, one last yeah. question, if, if you want my one more question. Yeah, no, no, pro no problem, no problem. One okay. of our uh, attendees is asking, uh, usually how many uh, months is the duration for one session of radio, radio frequency? Okay, and so you usually do, I tell, can, if you do a second them. section. Yes, yes, uh, you can uh, do it a second time. Yeah. So I usually tell them uh, six to nine months minimum. Okay. okay to nine months minimum but they get up to 18 months of pain relief that's a okay. good one and uh, i think you know i have i have patients where i've found up to 18 months of pain relief uh, but you know you have to do the job right so i've spent i spend about 45 minutes to do the rf because i've done bipolar i've done big legions you know and they've managed to get good 45 you know good uh, 18 months of pain relief after that so not everybody's same but i tell them Minimum six months, maximum 18 months. So it could be between six to 18 months. You know, local anesthetic steroid injections will give you about three months or three and a half months, but RF will prolong that to six months. So you get kind of, you know, twice the pain relief. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sadiq. Brilliant, right. thank you so much, Jim. And we'll, we'll catch up again. We'll see yes. each other in face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, in the Philippines sometime, okay. Yeah. And in London too, in London. Absolutely, too. I'll be, and, and then Dubai, possibly in Dubai as well, because I gather you were in Dubai last to last year. So we will, we will, we'll catch up. And uh, I, 
I see the post from uh, your your colleague as well, Pashel. So I think I see the post from her on on Facebook as well. So no, keep up the good work, guys. You you're doing excellent, excellent yeah. job. And you really, I think we all here to spread the knowledge, educate people. So yes, let's carry on doing the good work. I think it's quite good to do that. You know, it gives you satisfaction. And I and Jim, I like today. You started with, with the prayers, so which is yeah. you know I'm religious too, and it was quite nice. And I think you know we start with a really good tune and a really good note, and the whole yeah. thing goes well. So thank you so much, Jim. So okay. Much. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye now.